Hello, I'm Chris McCarthy from the American Chemical Society, and welcome to this media briefing from ACS Fall 2021. We're joined today by Dr. Devin Peterson and Brianne Linney from the Ohio State University. They're studying compounds that give coffee its distinctive mouthfeel. Brianne? Hi, uh, thanks for the introduction, Chris. So as he said, we're, I'm working on this with um, the, the PI of this research is Dr. Devin Peterson, who's also on the call. And then we're also working on this research with Chris Simons, uh, who's another professor at The Ohio State University. And so just for a brief overview of our research, this project, we, in this project, we're looking to identify chemical compounds contributing to coffee body. Um, and so, yeah, oh, thank you, perfect. Uh, so, so coffee body is a sub-attribute of the standardized idea of coffee quality. Um, and coffee quality has an impact on the value ascribed to coffees. So it determines how much money growers and roasters will get for their coffees. Um, and this quality, these quality scores are assigned by trained coffee evaluators, but appreciation for the nuances in coffee um, is really growing among consumers too. I actually just recently read a market research report which details market sales of coffee makers. And it specifically observed that the, the sales of traditional drip coffee makers is decreasing while sales of products more consistent with uh, more gourmet coffee experience like French presses and pour overs have been seeing increases. Um, and this has become even more exaggerated during the pandemic when people are drinking a lot of coffee at home and trying to really replicate that coffee house experience. Um, but our, our quest to understand compounds that contribute to coffee body um, ultimately has the potential to develop or to develop an impact or develop an understanding of compounds that can impact body and coffee quality um, and can allow prediction, modulation, um, and optimization of the levels of these compounds at various stages in coffee production, like growing, processing, roasting, um, and even brewing, to result in a cup of coffee with optimized quality, uh, which has the potential to ultimately benefit both manufacturers and consumers who are looking for that high quality cup of coffee. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, and so when we were looking into coffee body for this project, we saw that the definition assigned to it by the Specialty Coffee Association was the tactile feeling of the liquid in the mouth. Um, so it's led us to specifically focus in this tactile mouthfeel space, which is really a relatively unexplored area when it comes to flavor. A lot more research has been done in, this, in the areas of aroma and taste. And so this idea of, of texture or mouthfeel falls under what's known biologically as somatosensation which is the response of receptors on the surface of the skin to, to stimuli like touch, temperature, and pain. Um, and small molecules in food are known to activate somatosensory pathways. This figure on the middle here shows some of the small molecules from food and their ability to activate a diverse family of receptors in the trip receptor family. Um, these receptors typically respond to changes in temperature, uh, but are also capable of being activated chemically. A well-known example of this is the trip v one receptor, which is activated by capsaicin from chili peppers, which results in a burning sensation. Um, and while these are receptors that are typically respond to temperature, there's also examples for touch sensation, where chemical compounds from food activate touch pathways. And the best known example of this is sanchul from Sichuan peppercorns, which are often added to Chinese food and can result in this tingling type of sensation. Um, so a, a unique part of our study is that while some research has attributed body to gross viscosity imparted from something like polysaccharides or lipids, um, because we're aware of this, uh, of all of these small molecules in food activating somatosensory pathways, we took a little bit of a different approach um, that took this into consideration. And we wanted to see if there were small molecules in coffee um, that could impact tactile sensation, which feeds into this definition of body. Um, and so we ultimately approached this question by breaking body into tactile sub-attributes, training a panel of evaluators to evaluate samples based on these attributes, and then separating a coffee using preparative liquid chromatography coupled with mass spectrometer, and evaluated the fractions for sensory activity. Um, multiple iterations of this method ultimately allowed us to identify three to four compounds or fractions that contribute to tactile sensation in coffee. So thank you, Brianne and Dr. Peterson. Um, I'd like to ask you a few questions about your work. So what gave you the idea for this research? Do you wanna take this one, Devin? I mean, I certainly can, we both can take parts of the question. So <clears throat> the, um, 
research was really spearheaded by a consortium called the Flavor Research and Education Center. So a number of members have interest in specialty coffee and recognize this as kind of an area that is um, lacking in knowledge and understanding and propose this as a project. And we're fortunate to recruit Brianne uh, to work on it. So um, what is mouthfeel and how does it, how does it differ from flavor? So mouthfeel is kind of an abstract term. It, it doesn't really have a technical definition, um, but, but we usually mouthfeel is used to, to, to refer to these like textural or tactile aspects of a food product that can be really important when you're eating a food, um, but don't fall under aroma or taste. Um, and so we're bundling it under this somatosensory idea. And is there uh, an overlap between the flavor compounds and the compounds that contribute to the body? When you say for the one, so you mean like do, could compounds that contribute to taste and aroma also contribute to tactile sensations like mouthfeel? Yes. Um, yeah, there definitely is potential for there to be overlap. In some cases there could be overlap. A compound that imparts taste might also have a, have a tactile sensation too. And then there could also be instances where, where they're separate and it just imparts a tactile sensation or it just imparts a taste. So the, the mouthfeel of coffee, is that influenced uh, at all by the roasting or the brewing method? Uh, we think so, yeah. Um, I, I think even some of the compounds that we found in our research, um, it seems like there, there's trends where there's more or less of them depending on roasting. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if similar trends might be apparent for brewing as well. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, why this, why other researchers maybe haven't been able to identify to these, uh, uh, sorry, identify these these compounds um, before? Uh, so, so I think, like I, I kind of tried to touch on it in our in the cup, the little uh, intro I did, but. I think the approach we're taking with this project is really kind of unique. I, I think I, um, I think that we're the first ones that have kind of tried to take this approach of small molecules playing a role in tactile sensation. Um, I think that the majority, there isn't much research actually that focuses on coffee body to begin with. Um, and, and some of the ones that do mention it um, have typically regarded it as viscosity based, um, but people talk about body and how it varies even just within drip coffees. And if you think about drip coffee, the variation in like thickness and viscosity of drip coffees really isn't that different, but people say regularly that they have different amounts of body. Yeah, I think that just to add to Rand's comment that when we think about flavor, we often associate aroma uh, being the more important aspect of perception and certainly taste, um, you know, like bitterness and sourness of coffee coffee being also a part, but maybe more simple. Uh, when you get into the mouthfeel or somatosensory aspects, it's much more complex and more challenging, I would say, for Brianne to really have tried to find molecular drivers of these different sensations. And so it adds another layer of complexity and some challenges that she's had to overcome. And I think a part of the reasons why maybe it just hasn't progressed uh, historically. So were you able to correlate uh, certain compounds with particular types of coffee? Um, for example, dark roasted coffees have more or less of a certain compound. Like some of these compounds that we're seeing impacting tactile sensation. Right. So that is, we've seen some trends that way, but that's actually a, a later part of our study that we're going to look into a little bit more thoroughly. Um, so we do hope to get an idea of that because I think that's really important for roasters and manufacturers because that's where the value could come for them. Yeah, so a lot of the compounds that Rand has defined certainly would be logically influenced by processing steps like degree of roasting. And so, um, as Rand mentioned, we'll follow up on that. And once she has the molecular markers, one can really um, start broadening up more analytically to defining these or you know, the impacts of different processing steps on, uh, in this case, these sort of mouthfeel uh, precepts. So how did you pinpoint the uh, exact compounds that were responsible for these attributes? So the strategy that we used was, was using a technique called sensory guided fractionation, which is we just took coffee and separated it um, into multiple sections, um, basically to reduce the complexity and had a panel of tasters 
um, taste each of the fractions every time we separated it. Um, and if you can imagine, like we took a the really complex coffee to begin with and split it into say 12 fractions and had those all evaluated. Um, and then we would take the fractions that seem promising, separate those again. And so it's multiple iterations of this process until you get to a fraction that only has one compound in it. Um, and so then the panel says, I think this tastes like this, or I perceive this sensation when I taste this compound. Um, and so it's a time consuming process, um, but it's really just continual reduction of, of uh, complexity until we can attribute it to a particular um, compound. One, one thing that I would just add to Rand's comment is some of the things she's innovated is traditionally in flavor analysis, when we've done these so-called sensor guided or dilution, they look at a couple of sensors and do detector and not. And Rand has built in a lot of, I would think, controls for looking at subtle attributes or more um, you know, abstract in some regards. And so how do we really think through that to enable us to have that discovery um, in a more enabling way? And so I just wanted to add that that's some of her innovation. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little interested in this, uh, like this panel of experts, the, the tasters. What kind of feedback do you get from them as they, as they you refine this process? Uh, you know, are they kind of like, oh, this is, this is the uh, essence of this, this particular attribute? So that's a good question. Um, this is was a challenging panel to be on, like Devin was mentioning. It's their people aren't that familiar with describing their textural or mouthfeel perceptions. Um, so we had these sub tactile attributes um, that we had trained them to to evaluate, um, and that training was specifically based on we chose references that they had identified. We basically gave them a bunch of different references, and they said, okay. When I taste this reference, it tastes like, or it, I perceive it in the way that I'm perceiving these samples. So this matches what I'm describing. Um, but it really was, they, we incorporated a lot of controls, like Devin was mentioning, where we, they tasted the samples blinded, actually. So it wasn't just we gave them a sample and said, do you perceive anything in this or not? Because there's, there can be some inherent bias there. So it was, we gave them two samples and we said, which one is stronger in this? Um, and we saw that if like a majority of our, of our panel identified the fraction, then we looked at the descriptors they'd assigned to that. Um, but it was really, from a panel standpoint, a challenging panel to be on, but we saw we did see this agreement um, uh, in when there was a sensation present. Yeah, one of the things that, that I think Brand did nicely again with this is that it took an extensive amount of training. So I think attributes such as bitter or sour are a little bit easier for a panel to get alignment on and really know how to evaluate. When you start getting into sub qualities of, of tactile or sort of mouthfeel, it, it becomes a lot more challenging. But of course, um, you know, we validate and Brand has validated they can perceive these unique precepts and, and really allows us now to get into discovery in a much more complicated way. And I'd also like to point out just because something is subtle doesn't mean that it's not important. And I think that's um, a transition for our field that we often think about things that are really noisy or loud or you'd say apparent uh, being more important. And I'm, I would argue that I think some of Brand's work has the opportunity to really understand uh, premium coffee in a much, much more, um, I think, effective way. Great. Um, so could you talk a little bit about like, mechanoreceptors and, and have you identified any in the mouth that, that could bind to these small molecules? So, so there's a, a few different classes of mechanoreceptors that are known to be present in the mouth. The majority of, there's a lot of mechanoreceptors on your fingers, and for the most part, the same mechanoreceptors are present in your mouth. Um, and mechanoreceptors mostly just refers to nerve fibers that have these specialized, um, specialized receptors on the ends of them that are, uh, have been, have, are adapted to respond to stimuli such as pressure or like vibration. Um, and they, those are present in the mouth. Um, and I think what we're thinking is there, there could be a potential for those, like trip receptors are, are adapted to respond to temperature, but they are also able to be activated by chemical compounds. There's still potential for these mechanoreceptors, which are designed to respond to vibration or pressure to have other sites on either the nerve fiber or on the receptor where it's possible for chemical compounds to bind and activate a similar, um, cascade of cellular events. Yeah, I think that Brianne's laying a foundation here of what are these molecules, how do we sort of understand them, and then we could get into more of the mechanistics um, or aspects of perception and receptor to all aspects of it, whether it's, you know, 
uh, physical, chemical, you know, all aspects of that. So, but at least at, at this point, it's been a, a long few years for Brienne to get to this point and laying down um, some kind of good molecular basis to continue that work. Great. Um, so how could coffee producers or baristas use this information to make a better cup of coffee? So I think I mentioned um, on, on one of the earlier slides, I mentioned that this could, people could look at the impact of like growing and roasting on brewing, on, on the concentration of these compounds. But I do think brewing could, could alter the concentration of these compounds to brewing strategies. Um, I think that baristas optimize how they brew coffee all the time based on their taste preferences. And so I think that if, again, once you have these molecular targets, I think you could vary like the amount of time, the amount of water you're adding, um, the grind size, um, a lot of different things that they already vary, but, but this time with the target of getting a higher or lower amount of certain compounds that they now know that they want. And I think some of the value here is that you can get beyond empirical, right? So I think brand is any, people have done this empirically and figured out ways to, if you will, enhance or improve things or to go to a better desirable spot of interest. But once you have the molecular basis, you can really, I think, get into interactions or other aspects that are, they get much more complicated and allow obviously um, breeding programs and market selected, you know, uh, advancements to just the whole sort of supply chain. Um, you know, so there's a lot of, you know, coffee grown globally, only like a very small percentage of that is actually premium, uh, maybe 10% or something like this. So um, there's such an opportunity, I think, to advance um, a huge amount of material that's grown globally in a, in a much more monetary way and have better impact. So you touched on this a little bit, but what, what are the next steps for your research? So some of the next steps for us is to look at, um, look at how these compounds change during, during processing conditions. Specifically, one of the ones that we can look at is roasting. Um, we have like a, a pilot roasting setup, so we can, we can roast different beans and see how these compounds change throughout different degrees of roasting. Um, so that's a, an immediate next step for us. And I would just follow up with, with Brianna and say that again, that looking at mechanistically how they're occurring and understanding the perceptual piece um, maybe how, you know, ready to drink coffee is a huge growing area in the coffee world these days and how to storage, okay, and pack, for example, or that unique process of putting it in a can. So really any aspect of how do we think about delivering higher quality coffee, whether it's, um, you know, from a, a shop or from, you know, a can or whatever it be, is how do we just think about this in better ways to maximize the value of these, of this, um, you know, this, or this drink, or I was going to say commodity, but it's certainly going, you know, to high end product. Mm -hmm. Maximize it for manufacturers and consumers. I think consumers will get a lot out of it too. Absolutely right. As, as a coffee drinker, I thank you for that because it's very important to me. Um, and so finally, what, what would you want viewers to take away from the research you're doing and, and what, what's your key conclusion? Um, well, I think that I like maybe maybe I'm repeating, but my, I think the research can aid in coffee quality optimization, which has a lot of people who can benefit from that, uh, specifically manufacturers and consumers. Um, and then I think it also provides some insight into this kind of unexplored area of texture and mouthfeel and flavor. Um, and I think both of those are are meaningful contributions. I think brand is spot on. I think in the end, uh, premium coffee is sort of a go-to right now. How do we elevate the experience of coffee and probably one of the most consumed beverages on the planet? Um, and then also, again, in the end, how do we sort of expand flavor chemistry and perception to have better appreciation for other attributes that are often overlooked? Uh, you think about healthier eating, uh, whether it's by a cup of coffee a day or other dimensions of, you know, whole grain or, you know, all these pieces, how do we just do better at developing foods that, you know, allow us to improve uh, dietary patterns? Thank you. Uh, media briefings for ACS Fall 2021 will be posted throughout the meeting at www.acs.org slash ACS Fall 2021 br briefings.